one. Oops. What's up, Dealmaker Nation? Today is the finale of Sales Week. We have one of our biggest guests ever on the show today to wrap up Sales Week, where we bring on one of the top salespeople in our industry every single day to teach you how to close more deals. Guys, if you're having trouble closing deals or you've seen other people closing more deals than you, you definitely want to stay tuned. Even if you're crushing with sales, you got to stay tuned because today we have the one and only John Martinez joining us live in a second. Guys, John Martinez, I have personally seen him absolutely transform sales teams. Uh, I've been on sales teams where literally sales have doubled or tripled. Uh, John has trained over 400, that's right, 400 investors across the industry on how to up their game when it comes to sales. Um, I, I like to say I put my money where my mouth is. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll tell you, I'm actually attending one of his live events uh, next month, his uh, Psycho Mastermind. I can't wait for that. Uh, if you're watching this live, make sure to shut off your phone, shut off your email, shut off Facebook, and just stay tuned and invest in yourself for the next hour here with the one only. <laughs> Sorry. All right. We're trying to up our, we're that. trying to up our live stream game here. Still working on the kinks. <laughs> I thought it was, that was a really good. Job. Good. <laughs> How are you doing, John? Thanks for joining us. Yeah, I'm great. How are you doing? Doing excellent, excellent, excellent. Well, we have well. John Ma joining us. John, how are you doing? Doing pretty well, man. I'm really pumped for this. Uh, you know, I've always been a huge fan of John Martinez ever since I heard him from a few years ago, and uh, you know, just a real honor, real pleasure to have him on here. And I think uh, people here are going to have a huge, huge treat here. Awesome, awesome. So, guys, the topic that we're talking about tonight is how to handle situations where you're trying to buy a house, and there's a whole bunch of other people trying to buy that house. You know, I'm sure that if you're in the investing space. You've had this happen to you so many times before where you go to see a property and they say, hey, you know, I'm talking to two, three, four other people. Right. And a lot of people think the only way to win that is to have the highest price. But today, John is going to be talking to us about ways to win deals, even if you don't have the highest offer. Uh, so, John, uh, what are your thoughts? How, how do you do that? How do you how do you get a deal even if you don't have the highest price? What's the secret? Yeah, I mean, th there's no real secret. It, it's a ton of different things, like like anything else, right? Um, there's a ton of different ways that get you closer and closer to being able to do that. Um, and when you put them all together, you do it consistently, very, very often. But I'd say there's there's a few different pieces that you can focus in on to just make that happen, you know, more and more. Um, so, you know, I'm gonna. There's a couple of things I want to mention that I'm not going to yeah. cover, but I just want to mention them because they're important. And then I'm going to cover something that's really, uh, I've seen be just it's super simple to implement, very impactful. Anyone can start doing it on their sales calls today and start winning more deals. So um, that's what I want to cover. But first, let me just touch on how, how the investors that are out there doing it every day actually do it. Um, it's a totally different conversation. It's not a sales conversation. It's almost not even about buying a house. Um, the conversation is they really focus on two pieces during the conversation. Now, what, what I'm going to do is cover what you do at the tail end. But uh, on the beginning, they focus their conversation on two very, very key areas uh, with the home seller. Uh, the first area they focus in on is motivation. And, you know, motivation is like it's such a buzzword in REI, right? It, it's motivated sellers, motivated this, motivated that. And for good reason, because that's who we're all looking for. Because when you get someone who's motivated, you got a higher chance. It just makes everything easier. Yeah. But what the, the best investors do is they go really deep with that motivation. They they let that simmer for a while. They stay there. They ask questions about it. They dive in deep and they they they, they don't just go, you know, it's not a checkbox to them. I think with most most investors, it is a checkbox, at least the newer ones, right? where it's like, are they motivated? Um, well, they're uh, a tired landlord. Yes. And they move on and they drop motivation. Uh, so the conversations the best are having is they stay there for about 15 minutes and go deep into to those things and, and what they think about it and why it matters and, and all that kind of stuff. The second part of the conversation they focus on, which a lot of salespeople hate to focus on this, but it's super important, 
is uh, what we call deal killers, like anything that can get in the way, uh, anything that can stall out the deal, any concerns or objections that can just kind of derail stuff. And most salespeople don't want to bring it up. Like, you know, if I just sweep it under the rug and I don't talk about it, it's not there, right? But <laughs> the best, they bring up every reason why the deal could fall apart, every reason why they could leave without the contract. And they yeah. hammer into each one of those and explore them. Instead of just like, you know, hear no evil, see no evil, they, they attack them. So I don't want to brush over those because those are super important. So I didn't want to mention them. Yeah. Uh, but after doing those two things, after doing them well, uh, at the tail end, there is something that they all do. It's, it's the same move. It's the same strategy. It's not tricky or sneaky or manipulative, but it's handling the end of the sales calls, uh, no's and maybes and think it over. It's handling those all the same way that produces that higher close rate. Right, right. So I, I think that that is really important. One of the things you mentioned there is, is really key is like s not sweeping things under the rug. Right. Right. Like just if, if there's an elephant in the room, point out the elephant in the room. Right. Like what do you what do you see as some of some of the major reasons why people uh, lose deals and how would you approach addressing those with the seller? Yeah. So, I mean, like you said, it, you can't pretend something's not there. It's still there. And, you know, a lot of times people have people aren't used to selling houses to investors. This is probably the one and only time they've ever heard of it, considered it. Um, the closest they've ever gotten is, is they've seen We Buy Ugly Houses billboards, right? That's that's all they know about the entire industry. So oftentimes there's um, they've got concerns that uh, are easily addressed. Like, yeah, we do. We deal with this all the time. But <clears throat> if you don't bring them up, um, you don't get the opportunity to address them. It could be like, hey, you said, I'm, you know, the advertisement says you buy the house in seven days and they're sitting there going, I can't be out in seven days. And because you never bring up time frame, um, yeah. you, you, you can lose the deal, right? They could be going, hey, I love the offer. I love the structure. I can't be out in seven days. They're thinking yeah. that to themselves. You never talk Absolutely. about it. You lose the deal, right? Um, yeah. <laughs> excuse me. Yeah, we, we had that up in Express. The model was buy your house. In, we buy your house in seven days. Yeah. And like the first thing people would say on the phone a lot of times is, do I have to really be out in seven days? I can't be out in seven days. <laughs> yeah. The first thing I'd say is, it, it, you know, in terms of just bringing up everything, there's so much simple stuff you could deal with that kills deals that people just don't know because they, they don't talk about it. You know, you come up with something like that. You're like, no, we can do it in 45, 60. doesn't matter. You know, let's let's talk about it. But as far as one of the most common ones of those that people just miss or don't talk about I'd say the biggest one are, are influencers. Um, sales okay. has this nasty habit of just talking or salespeople, I'd say, or the whole sales industry. It's like we're so laser focused on this one question. Who's the decision maker? Who can get me my money, basically, right? Who can sign on the dotted line and make this all happen for me? And that that mindset is it, it's not good uh, because the fact of the matter is, is people have other people who influence their decisions in all kinds of big ways, small ways, anyone that could be impacted from that decision, um, tenants, kids, people who, people who realtors who want to list the house, family members who just think something else should happen with the house, um, neighbors, there's all kinds of people that are going to give their two cents on a property, whether people ask for it or not. So th the biggest deal killer I'd say that people don't ask about that kills more deals than probably anything is who else, you know, um, you know, who else is going to, you know, give you some type of opinion or feedback about whatever you decide to do, whether you ask about it or not. Or, hey, if you ask, you know, if you go ahead and we roll this out, you're like, I love what you put together. Let's just do it. Let's pretend you did it. Is there anyone who might, you know, reach back out and say, like, why didn't you at least run this by me first? Yeah. Because those people who people go to for advice, um, they're worried about what they think. So you can deal with a lot of that on the front end instead of ending up with the call that ends with, you know, let me get back to you. Uh, so yeah. the biggest deal killer, I think, is, is those relationships, those influencers that people just, they don't care about because like they can't sign the contract. So I don't care about them. You got to yeah. bring them up. You got to talk about them. You know, what's that conversation going to sound like? What kind of questions are they going to ask? That type of stuff. Yeah, that's so key. And, John, uh, I know you. Go ahead. Go John ahead. Mark. Go ahead. Yeah, so I was just going to say, well, what, what do you do after you kind of figure out who those influencers are? Say it's, uh, you know, someone they look up to as a neighbor or they, they have a realtor friend. 
Yeah. I mean, so obviously you don't want to tell them, oh yeah, don't just listen to them, right? You, you, you want to, yeah. um, I guess, frame it in some way that, hey, you know, there might be other people that may have an opinion. They might even be in a real estate industry, you respect their opinions. However, you know, what do you do to kind of quote unquote, put them out of that picture? Well, yeah. So you, what, what you want to do is you, you want to pretend like the conversation's happening now. You, you want to dig in and ask about it. And I'm going to give you some, some word tracks that you can pick up and use right now if you wanted to. But you want to have, here, here's what's going to happen. Let me go first go through the scenario. If you don't do this, what's going to happen is either the person's not going to move forward because they're worried about what this other person might think or what a like, confrontation might sound like, or they're planning to go ahead and get their opinion, right? There's lots of times where people are going to say, hey, I want to talk to you after I gather these offers or whatever. So that's going to happen if you don't bring it up. So if you do bring it up, what you want to do is bring that conversation or those thoughts that would have happened anyways and bring them to right now. So, uh, you know, the way I usually ask is, is just like I, I said before, I kind of reference it is, is like, hey, is, is there anyone who um, usually go to for their opinion or feedback on something like this? And if they say, yeah, uh, then I just I continue the conversation and I ask a couple questions like, you know, what are your thoughts about all this? Have you had a chance to talk to him yet? You know, once you go back to him and you tell him about what you're, you're, you know, all the options you're considering, what do you think that conversation is going to sound like? What questions are they going to ask? And then what you do is you can cover that conversation right now. You don't have to wait for it to happen and hope you get back with them and go back and forth. You can deal with it, right? They're going to go, you know, their biggest concern is, you know, that I don't just give the house away. So now I know when I get to my presentation, I'm going to have to talk about uh, you know, and when I get to the negotiation, there's some stuff I'm going to have to do to make sure they don't feel like they're leaving money on the table. Right. And I'm going to squash all of those either right now or during my presentation. So by the time I'm done and I ask for the deal, they're thinking like, you know, when I do talk to that person, I already know what I, we already talked about. It. I know exactly what I'm going to say, or, you know, I'm not, wor I'm not worried about that anymore because we talked through it. We want to relieve those things that could potentially stall out or kill the deal and just deal with them right now. So you just bring that conversation or that that those thoughts that would have happened later and you bring it to the, the moment and you deal with it. Yeah. So basically handling the objective before the objective comes up. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Now, John, do you ever try to get that person like like one thing I'm thinking is like, let's say you got a husband and wife, the husband's like ready to sell, and then he's like, Yeah, I just don't know what my wife is gonna think. Do you do you ever do you ever do something like, hey, let's get her on the phone right now? Or like, hey, could can she come join us later? Yeah. Can I can I come back later today and talk to the both of you? Do, you? do you think that if you have that option, it's a good idea to just try to yeah. talk to that person directly instead of going through someone else? Right. Absolutely. I mean, that's your best case scenario. Um, if you can do that, then then that's always option number one. The reality of the situation is 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 you can't do that all the time. Um, probably not even half the time. Probably not even a quarter of a time. It's they're busy. I'm not gonna get them involved. Whatever. Uh, so, so you have to have a plan B and that's, that's the best plan B, but obviously, yeah, anyone you, you want to be in front of everyone who's going to impact the decision in some way, but oftentimes you just don't get that opportunity. Yeah. Yeah. I'll, I'll tell, I'll tell you a funny story of absolutely not having that opportunity. Uh, when I was working at Express, we had this one sales guy, refail check, absolute legend. He's with market pro now, but just absolutely yeah. crush it. And there's this one lady that came through and she had inherited the house from her mother. Okay. And she really wanted to sell. She couldn't afford the house, need tons of work. Like she had to sell. But the only thing holding her back is she was like, my mother wanted this house to always stay in the family. And I, I can't imagine what like her spirit would do to me if like I sold this house. Like I, I think she'd be really disappointed. So interesting thing, the mother was cremated. And this, this, this seller is a very spiritual person. So yeah. Ray Falchon says, why don't we have a ceremony? We sprinkle some of the ashes in the yard and we ask her for her blessing. So that's an example, yeah. the best example I've ever seen of like where you, keep, you have this person that could mess up your deal, but it's impossible to actually contact that person. Yeah. But fun. it's still a way. There's always still a way. Yeah. The funny thing is that's not even the first real world example I've heard where someone who's already deceased got in the way, right? Yeah. <laughs> it happens. Uh, that's that's a second. It's number. So it doesn't happen all the time, but that's number two. It was the same situation. It was uh, this team I was working with could not get this deal closed. And this woman desperately wanted to sell. Um, but the it, 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 same thing. It was, um, it was her father's house and 
uh, all of this, his stuff was still in the property. And she was like, I'm just going to have to basically dump it. Right. The investor thought he was doing a favor, like we'll clean out the house. We'll trash it all. Come, you know, we went back in there. It turns out that's, that's my only memory of him. I don't want his stuff to be trashed. So she was in debt. She maxed out credit cards. She, she, she got the house, but couldn't afford it after her father passed. But so then after we dug in and found out what that deal killer was, that relationship, um, we were able to donate the stuff to people who could use it and keep it alive. And that was the best way she could honor her father's memory, even though she was so desperate to sell, to sell she couldn't because of that deal killer, which is yeah. just uh, another point I want to make is even though motivation is important, it's not everything. You can have yeah. some of the most motivated people in the world who do not take action. You got to address the stuff standing in the way. Okay. So tell me about that. How, how do you do that? Yeah. So one, one of them is just, just as simple as it is, is you got to ask the questions, right? So one of the biggest deal killers is going to be relationships influencers. We cover that. Another massive deal killer is just going to be kind of the risk and the discomfort. So a real easy, because nobody, nobody knows what to expect. Often haven't dealt with companies like this. Moving in general is just absolutely horrible, especially if you add some type of distress on it, especially, fi especially financial distress. Um, unknowns. Unknowns are a massive uh, source of discomfort. Like, how's this all going to work? What am I going to do with my stuff? Are you, can you come back and get me afterwards for the repairs? Is there going to be some kind of kink in the system? Right? right. So, again, dealing with all that stuff up front. And you would think like, hey, this is sales. You need this silver tongued insanely good way to ask about this stuff. But the problem is most salespeople just don't ask about it. So the trick is like drum roll, just ask, right? Nice. Like, Hey, let me ask you this after, you know, let's say we go through this, you accept the offer. You're thrilled as can be. You wake up tomorrow and you start freaking out a little bit. You're like, Oh shoot, I'm going to have to figure out a and B and C. What are those major concerns you have? And again, you take that and you bring it to the right now and you deal with them. Right? So risk and discomfort is another big one. Third biggest one, I would say, is other options, and that, that's that's moving up its its way up the list right now. Is other investors is massive, right? Um, realtors, every realtor is going to tell you you need to sell it through a realtor, and by the way, that realtor needs to be me. And um, you know, keeping it's an option, renting it's an option. People have all kinds of options, right? So addressing those options head on uh, again, do it now. Uh, needs to be done as well. That's a, the third biggest deal killer. And the way I would do that is you, you attack it head on and you just say something like, listen, you know, I'm not your only option here. You got, you got lots of ways, uh, lots of options, lots of things you can do. You know, it's early on in the conversation. I don't think either, either of us really know if we're going to be the best option for you or not. Let me ask you this. Have you thought about just listing it? Can you keep it another year or two? Have you thought about doing the repairs yourself? Right? because they have to have answers to those questions anyways, before they decide to do business with you. So if they don't have those answers, they're gonna have to give you a maybe or a think it over and, and wait until they come up with those answers, or you can help them come up with them right now by asking them the question. And again, it's like, it's already in their head. You're not bringing up something that that doesn't exist, right? If you, if you say like, hey, have you thought about just listing it? Nobody in the world is gonna be like, what do you mean? Who are these realtor people? I've never heard of that before. You're like, oh, I just killed my own deal. It's not going to happen. These things are there. They exist. You have to assist people with that, that decision process. Yeah. So bring up all the options instead of hiding them. Like, yeah. you know, some other investors are trying to do, just bring them to the, to the light. And that, with, that, that way you, you seem a little bit more trustworthy and authentic, right? It's not like, oh yeah, I'm the best guy. You're not this like salesman. It's like, well, I'm honestly giving you all the different options that you have available. And I'm telling you upfront. In fact, I think that's the first line is, well, we, we may not be the best fit for each other, right? right. And you anchor that idea to begin with. And I think that builds uh, you know a great deal of trust that I, I don't think a lot of people are doing what they're afraid to do actually. Yeah. And I see you put up a Facebook user question. What percentage yeah. would you say is asking questions versus selling yourself and, and your company? It's it's one in the same. Uh, so first of all, um, selling yourself, you do that by asking the questions. It shows you care. It shows you're seeking to understand their situation. It shows that you're not there just pushing something, but seeking to understand to see if you can help. So the way to sell yourself is to ask questions and to seek to understand so you can actually help. I mean, think about it like this. 
when you're talking about trust and selling yourself, right? When you're talking about selling yourself, you're really talking about building rapport and a certain level of trust. Um, salespeople have probably, it's like salespeople and lawyers are like the two lowest rated professions for trust. <laughs> um, if you think about who has the highest, I think it's, it's people like physicians, doctors, right? So just keep that in mind. Why are doctors so trusted? Why do we trust them? Well, we don't walk into the doctor's office, sit down and the doctor, you know, doesn't just turn around and go, Hey, I think you should start taking these pills. You'd be like, you're insane. You haven't even asked me why I'm here or what I need to, or, you know, there's no diagnosis. You, you probably called the authorities. Um, <laughs> what the doctor does is well, tell me what's going on. How long has that been going on? You know, what's that feel like? Is that impacting anything else? And have you done anything to try to, you know, fix it or, or feel better? Um, has there any been other any other changes? And when the doctors are done asking all those questions, you really feel like they understand. They ask questions you didn't even think that they should ask. And when they're done, you really feel like they understand. So when they make a recommendation, a prescription, prescribe a certain course of action at the end of that visit, you trust them, right? So my answer is is it is the question asking that sells yourself. And then you get into another question, which is presentation when you're selling the company. And when you, when, when you sell, there may not need be a need to sell the company uh, when you present, only if there's, if you're uncovering motivation and deal killers, or maybe if some of the deal killers are, are you legit? Well, then you need to sell the company. Then you need to talk about experience and track record and easily, uh, you know, things they could easily find on their own. So, um, I know I just threw a lot out there, but uh, I kind of threw off oh. everything. But I, I get excited when I talk about sales. This is this is my group. It. Yeah, no, this is great. Super, so, super valuable. Out of all those things that you listed, you would prioritize those things over the actual sales presentation. Is that what I'm hearing? Yeah, sales of presentation. There's closing the presentation. That's like that's the easy, easy, easy stuff when you do all the, the beginning stuff. Think about it this way. Um. Closing is like uh, closing is like a title fight, right? Like a boxing match. I used to love, you know, growing up. I remembered, um, you know, you always have all these fond memories of your kid as when you were a kid. And I remember when my dad would have people over to the house to watch the Tyson fights. And I knew yeah. nothing about boxing, but it was like the most exciting thing for me ever. Adults coming over and like treating you like one of the guys. And anyways, um, when those boxers stepped into the ring, um, the fight was already over. It was already won or lost based on what they had done the previous three to six months. That right. yeah, yeah. The, 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 the preparation, the training, the nutrition, all of that, it's done when they get in the ring. Whoever had done that the best, that is who was going to win. They were gonna, they, there was no trickery. It's whoever prepared the best. In sales, it's the exact same. Those right. questions, the motivations, the deal killers working through that conversation, that is what wins or loses you the deal. When it comes time to present and close, that's just like when those boxers step into the ring. It's done. The sale is done. The presentation, you just use what you had already learned in the first half of the conversation and connect the dots between what you can actually do for the person. Does that does all that make sense? Absolutely. Yeah. I think it's a really interesting way of looking at it because you realize a lot of uh, realtors are trained in a certain way where they're just trained to just kind of go over the sales presentation, right? The presentation's everything without even talking about themselves, you know, or, or what you were saying, asking the right questions and kind of having a human to human interaction. Right. The presentation can be, I'll give you another example. Um, your presentation can actually kill deals for you. Uh, if you yeah. don't ask the right questions before, let's pretend, I mean, I, I train realtors now too, and we were on a call today talking about this subject and, um, a lot of people are like, you know, well, we have the best, you know, in our listing presentation, we talk about um, we're the biggest. We have we do the most transactions. Um, we've got the, the most people on staff, you know, like we're the biggest, baddest. So why not go with us? But what if you, you led with your presentation? You didn't have a conversation. And one of the biggest deal killers that this prospect had for you is, listen, I've sold my house twice, you know, in another state with the biggest and the best. And I felt like I was just a number. In fact, this was a big decision for me and they're selling multi-million dollar houses. And I felt like I was kind of just swept under the rug. 
Well, if you lead your presentation, we're the biggest and we're the best, that's going to actually kill the deal. You think you are like, oh, this is going to lock it down. Let me tell you about our company. And they're thinking, I will absolutely not do business with you because that's the last thing I wanted to hear. You have the right conversation first. You know how to go into that presentation with, listen, I want to tell you something. Um, I know you have those concerns we talked about, about the larger agencies, but I want to tell you a lot of our growth, a lot of the reason why we have so many people on staff is we've uh, put together teams that stay in, in, in daily or every other day communication to update you with the showings and the feedback and really hold your hand through the process. So while we are the biggest, the re one of the reasons we are the biggest is because we know how important that continuous support and communication is, no matter what kind of house it is, right? So again, a presentation that you think is awesome might actually kill the deal if you don't have the right conversation first. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I've seen this happen over and over again with direct mail. There's like some people that respond well to branded direct mail, but a lot of people respond better to non-branded mail, you know, because they don't want to deal with that big company. So that's a great example. Also, like with the gathering information, uh, like it's so true. Um, I'll give you an example of how this helped me do exactly what, what, what you teach. I was out on a deal and I'd been asking a lot of questions, just not talking at all. Actually, my wife did most of it. She was asking a lot of questions, getting a lot of information, understanding the precise situation. The seller wanted to leave the house to go move up to Northern California and go live with his girlfriend. Okay. He just wanted out of the house. House needed tons of work, was full of junk, all this stuff. And we get to the negotiation and we're like $150,000 off. I'm like, yeah, you could get that number if you did all the repairs yourself. And he's like, well, yeah, well, I could just do the repairs myself. Like for an extra $150,000, I'll just do the repairs myself. So I say, well, why don't you? Yeah. And then also, so I'm getting, and then also he's like, oh yeah, well, I just want out. You know, yeah. I just, I just want to move up north. I want to get out of this house. So like just having that information, when I said, when he was like, yeah, I'll just do the repairs myself. I knew he was not going to do the repairs himself. He wanted yeah. to move up north. Yeah, but but again, yeah, that, that's brilliant because you you didn't tell him, like yeah. you didn't go into this this diatribe about well that's silly because B, A B C and D, you mm -hmm. let him self discover it and and that's that's what, what the questions and, and all that conversation should do is you help him self discover right because you're yeah. like well that sounds you know if you want that one fifty, why not just do the repairs and then there's a moment of silence I bet you there's a moment of silence yeah. we thought about it and went well because I don't want to or I don't have money. And now he just sold himself, but it's the questions that did it. We can't tell people to do stuff, but we can help them think and, and get the right answers. Uncovering yeah. the motivation, yeah. Asking the right questions. Yeah, so we, we gotta have Brittany joining, by the way. Brittany, thanks for ju jumping on with us. Yeah, sorry about the technical difficulties, but I'm excited to talk. Awesome, so guys, okay. Brittany is gonna be leading the Baltimore Dealmakers group. Uh, so she's gonna be starting to join and host some of these shows live with us. So welcome, Brittany. Thanks. So uh, what have you guys covered so far? I, I've been doing a little bit of research and I'm really interested in the concept of going negative. And it sounds like you guys are kind of talking about that. Yeah, I, I think, well, yeah, the question on the screen and, and kind of what they talked about is, you know, how do you deal with diagnosing a client if they're a little reluctant to buy? And they, you know, every sales training, I think, has some version of it. It ties back to a psychological principle called psychological reactance. And all that means is as human beings, we're hardwired to kind of bust the system, push back, right? Someone tells us what to do, we do the opposite. I mean, look at, look at the country right now. And I'm not going to get into any anything political. I'm not going to get into any views, but I just want to show you a very real example of this in action, right? The whole mask situation. You tell some people to wear masks, it's only going to go as far as you are infringing on my right. You are infringing on my freedom to do what I want. And psychological reactions, that's literally the definition, is anything impinges that on, on our freedom, we fight back fiercely for it. So anything at all we're asked to do. And if you got a two-year-old, you've seen this. I've got, I've got uh, young kids at home, you tell them to do something, they say no, even if they like want to do it, right? Or if one kid picks up a toy, since I can't have it, I need that toy. So once you understand that concept, as a salesperson, you learn not to be pushy. Instead of pushing people to answer questions, pushing people towards a certain outcome, pushing people to adopt your beliefs, pushing people to think like you do, you start to do the opposite. 
because you know the harder you push, the more they're going to push back. And they don't even think about it because it's just human nature. So right. instead of pushing, we pull back. We always go towards the no and not towards the yes. So if someone's reluctant to answer questions, then instead of saying something like, listen, I'm just trying to help you. I thought this was important to you. You know, you were thinking that or just giving up. Then you're going to pull back and say something like, listen, I get the feeling that maybe timing's not right or selling right now is, is not that important to you. I, I feel like I might have put some pressure on you or maybe I've just read the whole situation wrong. Um, my gut's telling me that regardless of the offer or whatever we put together for you today, it, it's just not a priority right now and, and maybe not something that you need to deal with at the moment. And then I'm going to sit back and again, let that person self-discover, right? Let them, let them go like, Oh, wait, is, is that the, if that is, that might be the case. If that is the case, I want to know, right? Like, why am I wasting my time? But oftentimes what will happen is then they'll have a reset. They'll say something like, no, no, that's not the case. I'm just whatever. Or in the whole mentality resets, because now instead of you pushing to ask questions, they're going to ask to continue the conversation. Mm -hmm. So the whole concept is just um, be a little reluctant to buy. Always lean towards the no, never push towards the yes. John, do you mind if I, I get your thoughts on a sale that I messed up that I think I lost about a hundred thousand dollars on? <laughs> yeah, back sure. on what I did wrong. Okay, so situation is there's a seller definitely, definitely, definitely needs to sell like right away, like huge financial burden. Also wants to move to Georgia. She's in California right now, wants to move to Georgia to be with her daughter. House is free and clear but it's like a hoarder's house, needs tons of repairs, has a leaky roof, all of that. So she's she's got to sell, she's got to sell to an investor. I'm the first one to talk to her. I get, the ARV on this thing is $920,000. I get price agreement at 630,000, okay? Yeah. And then she's like ready to sign. I have the paperwork all written up and I hand her the paper and the pen. She just stares at it for a second. And then she says, you know, I just got to pray about this. And then I was like, okay, well, why don't we just pray about it together? Right? Like, <laughs> again, it was like this, I was like, now there's another gatekeeper, God, right? I'm like, let's pray yeah. about it. And she's like, no, I just, I, just I, I need some time to pray about it. So I'm like, okay, probably tomorrow she's going to sign this thing. I call her back the next day. And sure enough, the neighbors offered 700,000, like messes up my deal. And say, also says, whatever he offers back, I'll beat by $5,000. Yeah. Uh, now, I know a lot of people that say that you should wait until the person is like gives you an upfront agreement that they're ready to sign that day. I didn't do that on that appointment. I didn't have an upfront agreement. Do you think that that's where I messed up on that? Do you think, or do you think there's something else going on? No, I don't think that's where you messed up on it. Uh, I what I think is there was a hidden deal killer. There was something else, and you don't know what it is again until you ask about it. So at that point, I would have asked and said, you know, I would I, I would have said, you know what. I think that's probably the right thing to do. As we've been talking, I've been getting the feeling that something's on your mind. There's still some concerns, some stuff you haven't worked through yet, some, some questions you still have that you're going to need to figure out. Um, so I, I, I think that is the right course of action. While we're sitting here, do you mind if I ask, what are your biggest sources of concern right now? What are those things that as you pray and as you go on, and as you think about this, you're going to have to figure out? Right. And I'm going to, so I'm now giving permission and inviting, well, my neighbor offered, or, you know, I don't know if the time is right, or what if I could get more money, or I promised Susan across the street, I was going to go talk to her. It's again, let's deal with it right now. So yeah. the way I would have gone is, is given full permission, because I know if I can uncover that stuff, I've got a chance of still closing the deal right now, if we can get it dealt with. Right. And if it's, I promised the neighbor that I, I would have, you know, I, I'd, I'd, um, I'd give them a shot at it. That's fine. If that's what you promised, that, that's what you promised. Can, can I ask you a question? Someone's kind phone. Of, yeah, I don't know what that was, but you know, I, I jump back into the sale. Like, hey, now that it's over for today, can I ask you a question? If you're planning to go with them or to them the whole time to, to get an offer, why was it that you invited me out here? Right. right? And, and just start to, well, I don't know if they could close. I don't know. You got to keep asking questions and digging in. So I, I would say the biggest problem that happened there is you just you took that as an answer instead of really digging in to find out what was going on. The trick yeah. is you got to do it without being pushy, right? You can't be the, you know, what do I have to do today to to get you to sign, guy? You can't be that guy, but you have to, in an elegant way, 
dig in with more questions. And again, that was another example of going negative or pulling back, right? I gave full permission so I could get to the truth. I think you should do that. I think you, if you feel like you need to pray, then, then you should pray. You know, now that it's over for today and, and we're, we're closing out the conversation, can I ask you a question? What is it that you need to pray about? What, what's the biggest concern? How long have you been thinking about that? You know, and then now I could get to it. Now I've just increased my increased my chance of dealing with that objection, dealing with that deal killer, putting it behind me, and going forward and, and finishing out the sale. You know, I, I think you're a hundred percent right on this, and I'll tell you what I did after that it just verifies everything that you just said, and that is uh, after she picked her neighbor, I asked her. I said, if if I could give you the same amount of money, would you have gone with me? And she said, not unless it was really significantly more because my neighbor helped me with my roof when it had a leak. He was a contractor. He's put yeah. some tarps on her yeah. and I feel indebted to him. So I would probably go with him anyways, unless you were like $50,000 more. Yeah. So a hundred percent what you're saying. I, I, I should have, I, I don't know if there's a way to figure that out on the initial appointment, but I think yeah. maybe if I asked more questions, I could have probably, probably gotten that out of her that she was even thinking about talking to the neighbor. So yeah, I mean, we can uncover that stuff. Is that there's always competition now? So a great question to ask is: Listen, you're gonna probably you have talked to a lot of people. You are talking to a lot of people, or at least you know you got a lot of options. Let me let me ask you this question: Let's say there's two or three or four options you have, or two investors and a neighbor or whatever it is, and everyone kind of offers the same amount of money because you know the value of a house is what the value of a house is, and, and all the offers come in about the same. How in the world are you gonna decide who to go with? And that's how you start to find, even when the money's the same, what what, what are what are the competitive advantages, right? With that question there, we've been, well, I'm gonna go to my neighbor because he helped me out and I feel really indebted to him, right? Okay, that's my competition. Any other investor, I don't have to beat any other investor. Uh, any other option, I don't have to beat any other option. I've gotta beat only one person, the neighbor that feels indebted. So you, you then know, I don't have to compete against anyone else. And then you can start kind of chopping down that tree. Gotcha. Do you think the sellers are often answering that question um, honestly? Because oftentimes I get the feeling that you know I, you can tell that a seller is talking to multiple different people. You know, they they called your phone number. They probably called a bunch of other numbers, especially if it's an online lead, right? They probably submitted their form to multiple sites. A lot of times they kind of have this um, like the shield up. It's like you know right. I'm talking to you. I'm barely revealing anything. It's like they want to hide the fact that they're talking to a bunch of people. And when you bring it up, you can tell that they have that reaction. It's like oh crap, like you've sort of caught me. You know you you see that yeah. reaction sometimes. How do you get them to really open up about that and just kind of make it a you know make it not so much of a hey you know me against you, but hey let's figure this out together type thing. Yeah, good question. People put walls up. We all put walls up in every sales situation, most sales situations, because it, whether it's real or imagined, they feel some type of pressure or discomfort. If I tell you everything, you're going to use it against me. I might not be able to get the best deal. I might leave money on the table. You might try to close me, right? Now, these are all reasons, real fears that people have. They might be real or imagined, right? You might not do that stuff to them, but they've heard about other sales situations, been in other sales situations. So the only way to get open on this conversation is to let them know that that is not what you're doing. Um, we call it setting this, there's ways to do it. We talked a little bit about pulling back or going negative, um, being very reluctant to, to do the deal. Setting expectations up front is huge. We call it setting the stage. We had three key areas, time frame, agenda, and outcome. So we start to take down those walls immediately with something like, listen, Jan, um, I just I just uh, want to give you, set the right expectations for today. Uh, number one, thanks for inviting me out. Uh, these things usually take 30 to 45 minutes, sometimes less, sometimes more, but that's the average time. Um, while I'm here, it, it's pretty simple. Um, just want, want you to show me around the property. I'm going to have some questions for you so I know how to, how to put an offer together. If I need to take any timelines or anything else into consideration, I'm going to answer every single question you have. And at the end of it, the only thing I want to accomplish here is give you my best offer. Um, and if that works for you, great. We'll talk about next steps. But if, if, if anything about it doesn't work, doesn't feel right, you're not comfortable moving forward, listen, no big deal at all. I make about 10 of these offers a week. Two people say yes. I never know which two it's going to be. My only goal here is to get you my best offer. Whatever you do with it is whatever you do with it. And doing, doing something like that, setting those proper expectations, that helps to relieve some of those walls 
to, to take away that, that misleading and stuff. Cause it's natural. It's human nature. People feel pressure. They're going to fight or flee. So sometimes that doesn't show itself as people not answering questions. Sometimes it shows itself as people being really aggressive. Like, listen, you came here, you said you'd give me an offer. Just give me the offer. If you're not going to do that, leave. Same thing. It's that, that perceived pressure and discomfort. You either fight or flee like in any other human scenario where we feel threatened. Wow. John, those are, I mean, some awesome tips, but how do you use that tactic in the first 10 seconds when you're cold calling a lead? Yeah, yeah. So the first 10 seconds when cold calling a lead. Um, well, you, again, let's just kind of get in that 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 person's mind frame. I, th I think one of the biggest problems salespeople have is they kind of think like, I'm a salesperson. I'm a totally different um, like uh, animal than, than the people I'm calling. Like we're two different species. They're the same as us. So let's just think about how we handle cold calls, right? If I get a cold call, well, usually, I don't even pick up my phone anymore. But if I would get a cold call, I'm usually thinking, you know, who are you? What do you want? And I'm immediately thinking, oh, you're going to try to shove something down my throat, right? Just like anybody else, right? Who are you? What do you want? And what do you, oh, you're annoying. What are you going to try to shove down my throat? What do you want me to buy? So knowing that it's the same thing. We're going to set expectations on the first uh, 10 seconds of a cold call. There's some other tricks you can use like tactical empathy too. Tactical empathy is uh, being a little bit unsure, right? Like if I'm really aggressive, you're going to push back. Well, let me, let me, I'm going to explain this because I'm going to give you a script. So I think it's important. Tactical empathy. When people are hurt, think about if you had a dog, you opened up your door and there's this puppy on your doorstep and the puppy had one of those limps, you know, uh, gorgeous. What are you going to, you're, what are you going to want to do? You're going to want to help. If you're like, Oh my gosh, how can I help you? Come in. Let me give you some water. Humans are that we're empathetic. It's natural. So if someone's a little uneasy, then it makes us want to help them. When people ask for help, we want to give it. So keep that in mind as I give you this script. I'm going to kind of be uneasy and I'm going to ask for a little bit of help. Uh, the next things are setting those expectations, right? Um, why am I calling? And then by the way, I'm not going to try to shove anything down your throat. So if I'm opening up a cold call and I've written these scripts, it's funny. I wrote scripts years ago and they're like everywhere now. Uh, so you might've heard some of this before. But I promise you, it, it's originally from me. I remember I wrote this one in Houston, Texas, working with a company called One Two Three Sold Fast with uh, Will Danker, an amazing human being. Um, hey, listen, sorry for calling you out of the blue. I'm not even sure if I've got the right number here. Um, I was calling about a property on One Two Three Main Street. Um, I was interested in buying it. I have no idea if it's for sale. I had no idea if, if you are the owner and if you are, if you even have any interest in selling it. And I just shut up, right? I just took off all of the, wow. what, would, what would a typical cold caller do, right? Just go right at it. Just, hey, um, I'm dropped. Gonna sell your house, right? And you yeah. get this nasty, like immediate pushback. So that's how I'd handle it. I'd use that tactical empathy. I'd be unsure. I'd not make any assumptions. And I'd put it out there, basically using a takeaway and and, and just let it go. And there, there's some variations of that, right? Uh, if you want to go negative while doing it, then you'd say, listen, I'm not even sure if I have the right number. Um, I'm calling about, I'd love to make an offer on 123 Main Street. I, I'm guessing that I don't even have the right number. And if I do, you have no interest in selling, right? So I just pulled it all the way back. And then I just shut up again. And they're either going to tell me, you're right, I'm not the owner. You're right, I have no interest. Or, well, no, actually, I was thinking about selling or I am open to it, right? So again, you can, you can ask the question without even asking the question. So there's a couple of variations of, of some opening cold call scripts. Awesome. That's incredible. We actually, my wife tried something similar to this on texting and it boosted our response rate like, I don't know, like 20, 30%. What she does is she starts each text message with, hey, I know this is random, but just yeah. tacking that onto the text message, 20, 30% boost. People are trying, yeah, this is random, but yeah, yeah no, I am interested in selling. How did you yeah, get the timing so perfect? <laughs> I think um, I know with me and I might be projecting this or generalizing it, but I remember when I was early in my sales career, I was so concerned with being just just so extremely professional. And I felt like the more professional I was, the more credibility I'd have. So saying something like I'm not even sure if I have the right number, that was like for me, I couldn't do it because that, that was a slap. I should know I have the right number. That's a slap in the face of my credibility. So I just go like. Mr. Johnson, you own 123 Main Street. I'd like to make you an offer, thinking that that confidence would 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 result in better results. But it's, it's 
you know, you, you get some kind of nasty response. Whatever you're gonna we all know the responses you get if you go into a call that way. Um, I think a lot of it is people feel this need, at least I did. So again, I may be projecting, but I felt this need to be so professional. I could not let myself even open up to the fact that I might be making a mistake or have the wrong number or, or anything like that. Yeah. John, what are, what are your thoughts on time constraints? Do you, you think that, is this something that you train people to use? Do you, some people like them, some people hate them. It sounds like you're more laid back. Do you use time constraints when, when you're giving offers? 100% absolutely. Um, always give a time constraint. You just gotta do it the right way, right? There's a very, very pushy way you can do it. And there's a, a wrong way, or I mean, there's the right way to do it. So if I go through my sales process and I know I've covered everything, um, absolutely all the motivations, all the deal killers, I overcame resistance. I set the stage. Everything's out on the table. This person, we have now talked through everything and covered everything to give them enough information to make a decision. I know I did my job and I did it in a very good way. So at the end of that sales call, if I'm not getting a decision, it, it, I, and I take it to the extreme, you don't need to take it to this extreme, but it's right there. It's a one call close or it's nothing with me because I know I covered everything possible for them to make the decision. So at the end, if I get anything other than a yes, it's a no. And it, it doesn't matter how sweet it sounds. It doesn't matter if it's a, I'm in love with you and I'm gonna tell you yes tomorrow morning, I just need to sleep on it. It doesn't matter how great it is. The fact of the matter is if you don't have a contract, you don't have a contract. Mm -hmm. Anything other than a yes is a no. No matter what it sounds like, no matter you know uh, what disguise it's wearing, you have a deal and if you don't have a deal even if they told you you're the greatest thing in the world and you're doing they're doing it in 10 minutes right now you don't have a deal so i can i, I close it I, I give them the no if someone refuses to give me a note in a very nice nurturing way i say something like listen i appreciate that after everything we've talked about and, and, and talked through every reason why you you would sell and the reasons why those are important and, and all the concerns you have when you're kind of, you know, going through this decision. If at this point you're still uncomfortable about moving forward, I think we need to just call this what it is. It, it, it's a no and, and that's okay. It, it, it's perfectly fine, right? So that's one way to do it. Um, and, and, and you just, you, 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 you give them the no. You have to give them the no. Yeah, um, it's almost like you're labeling the no. You are, you're just, you're calling it what it is, right? We just decided yeah. together kind of on this call that if it's not a yes, it's a no, it's, it's very binary, that that's it. Anything other than a yes is a no. So you're just telling them anything other than a yes is a no. Um, and, and that's okay. And, and one of three things always happens. There's only three potential outcomes and everyone is gonna increase your chances of closing the deal. So the first one, and this is the worst one. The first one is they, you, you gave them permission to tell you no. It really is a no. It's not a maybe. It's not I'm going to call you tomorrow. It's not a let me think about it. It's a no. And that's the worst thing that can happen. But that puts you still in a better position because now you know what you're dealing with. Now you can plan accordingly. Now the follow-ups are going to be different. Now all the pressure's relieved. So when you do follow up, they're not going to go, oh, this guy's going to ask me if I'm ready now. I'm not going to answer the phone. It's going to be, we already agreed it's a no. It's cool. He was cool with it. He didn't pressure so follow-ups are more effective. So the worst thing that can happen is you actually uncover the truth and it makes follow-up more effective, okay? Worst thing, that's a good thing. Next thing that can happen is that it is a maybe. And the only reason you're gonna still have a maybe is because there's still some stuff they gotta figure out. There's some hidden deal killers you didn't get to, you missed somehow in your sales call. Typically the response sounds something like, no, 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 it's, it's, not, that, it's not that it's a no. I just, I gotta figure out I got to talk to my neighbor, right? In your situation, right? It's, it's I got to talk to my neighbor. I said, I'd give him a shot at this thing. He fixed my roof. It, it was a big deal. I, I said, I'd give him a shot, right? You're going to, you're going to draw out that hidden deal killer, right? And if that happens, you still might not get the deal, but now you, ha you at least know some more information. You can try to deal with it. You can try to get past that one. And once you solve that, potentially close the deal. So you close some of those. The third thing is, is sometimes, and if you did your motivation right, and they, they were in, in emotionally invested and they really want to get rid of it, sometimes we just don't make decisions until we have to make decisions, especially big decisions, right? Big decisions we wait on, we think about as long as we can until it's time, and then, then we go with our gut. So a lot of times this is a case, it's a big decision. So sometimes, best case scenario, 
you tell them it's a no, it's over, and they don't want the opportunity to slip away. And you hear something like, you know what? Forget it. I, I've been dealing with this long enough. I've just got to put it behind me. They'll justify it and you'll do the deal. So any three, those are the only three outcomes that can happen when you give them a no. Those are the, and all three are good. All three of them put you in a better selling uh, position. Right. Um, so I don't know if you've noticed uh, more and more teams are training out there are trying to close virtually. Yeah. Is that something that you're seeing? Do you think uh, teams that are trying to close virtually are losing anything? Uh, are they leaving anything on the table or, if, you know, things are slipping through the cracks at all by, you know, not trying to set an appointment and visiting them in person? Yeah, we did a survey in our, out of our clients, and I think we've got like 1,700 enrolled in our program right now. And 25%, um, or let me rephrase that, 75% did virtual at least all the time, full time, or part of the time their sales calls were virtual calls. So it's extremely common now. Only 25% of our clients are still strictly face-to-face. -face. Um, so it's extremely uh, common. You can sell just as much. You, you lose a little bit. You, you lose. I'll put it to you this way. Uh, it, I mean, teams are thriving fully virtual, but I'll put it to you this way. If you want a deal and you have the, you need this deal and you've got the opportunity to, to do it virtually or to go face to face, you're going to have a greater chance of locking it down face to face. You do have an edge. There's uh, time constraints are a little bit more relaxed when there's silence on the phone. It's different when there's silence face to face. You can read body language and know when it's time to use things like tactical empathy or pulling back or how they react to certain questions and when to dig in more. So you have there are some advantages to being face to face. I don't want to say it's necessary, but I, but what I am saying is if everything else is equal and it's virtual versus face to face, you increase your odds being face to face. Right. At what point would you, uh, I guess, in that process, actually set an appointment or you feel like you maybe you can't push any further virtually? At what point would you try to set an appointment? Yeah. So a, a lot of a lot of teams I work with go for the virtual. And if they just can't push it past the end, then they transition it into a, a face to face. Um, so uh, at what point? I mean, you don't want to cut yourself off early. You don't want to just, if you, if you want to go virtual and that's part of your business plan, right? It's, Hey, I want to expand or I only have this many acquisition agents or I can only see so many houses for whatever reason, if your business plan is to do as much as possible virtual, do not bail out, try to close it virtual. If that does not we'll go all the way with it, there's not like a go halfway. And if it doesn't feel good, go face to face. It's go all the way, uh, make the offer. And if they're still not there, then flip it into a virtual appointment and, you know, Hey, here's what I can do. Um, let me get some eyeballs on the house. Let me uh, drive out there. I want to see the neighborhood. I want to see the area. Um, knowing more information. I don't know if I can, but if I can give you more, uh, more money then then, you know, I'll definitely increase the offer. Um, and, and we'll just kind of talk through this for five, 10 more minutes. I just flip it into to a face to face and you're going to still have the same conversation and you might have more trust then. it might, you might uncover some more things that killed the deal. Here's the bottom line. There's only two reasons why deals don't happen. Two and that's it. There's not like this, this endless list of reasons why deals don't happen. There's two reasons and two reasons only. Reason number one, there's not enough motivation, right? Typically, these are retail sellers, but there's not enough motivation. It doesn't matter. You can try to give me stuff. If I don't want it, then I don't want it. They, you know, you're not going to sell me into it. You can, you know, if someone offered me a wedding dress... Uh, I don't need a wedding dress. I'm, need a wedding dress. I'm married and I'm a guy. I'm not going to wear it, right? It, you're not going to sell it to me. So that's no motivation, right? You can say that the wedding dress is $10,000 and you'll give it to me for $100, but I have to make the decision in the next one minute. Still not going to buy it because there's no motivation. So that's why I said the greatest salespeople are digging deep into motivation. So number one, lack of motivation. So you got to have a way, questions to ask, to figure out what the motivation is and at what kind of level is it at? How important is it? Is it, is it compelling enough for them to take action? The only other reason deals don't kill or deals don't die is because of deal killers. Hidden, hidden deal killers, right? If there is enough motivation, what's in the way that, that's keeping this thing from moving forward? They want to. It's either going to be a relationship, a risk, a discomfort, maybe other options, right? Those, those are the only things. So I think it's important when we talk about anything, even virtual versus face-to-face, -face, 
at the end of the day, it's about an open, honest conversation. And it's figuring out, does this person have motivation that's compelling enough to take action? And it's about digging into it, not only so you understand it, so that motivation comes to the surface and they, they're living in it and they go, I really, you know, they feel it. They feel that sense of urgency. And the number two, once you feel that sense of urgency, this is something you want to do. Let's talk about all the things that might get in the way. So those are, it's important just to remember that this is not as complex as a lot of people make make it out to be. There's only two reasons why deals don't happen, and those are them. I think oftentimes a wholesaler investor will say it's the price that wasn't good enough, right? There's always someone else that, that will pay, you know, five thousand or maybe even ten thousand more. How do you deal with the situation like that, where a seller, um, you know, they're probably talking to three or four other wholesalers, other investors, and you know, there's someone that gave them a pretty compelling offer. Uh, how do you how do you really compete with that? Yeah, it, it's it's the exact same answers I, I've, I've given. It, it's having the right conversation and, and, and understanding their motivation. I'll, I'll give you all kinds of examples. Number one, here's some examples. So just some quick questions anyone could do on their own. Um, to, so you understand that money isn't everything. Okay, Here, here's my questions. Look at your house. Is your house the cheapest house you can buy? It's built to give you shelter. Did you spend more on your housing than you could have? 100% of people are, or 99% of people are going to say, oh, I could have got cheaper. I could have got smaller. I could have got a different area. But, right, look at a smaller decision, right? Um, could you spend less on uh, the food you eat? What's food made to do? Food is fuel. It's just meant to give, keep you alive and to keep you alive for a long time. So if you're judging food by the question of, um, you know, or, you know, with that, could you have bought cheaper? Did you have to buy this expensive stuff or the snacks? The answer is no. Think about um, your car you drive. Could you have bought a cheaper car? We can go through this forever. Every answer is always going to be, oh, I could have got it cheaper, but I spent more money. So number one, if we look at our own lives, money plays a part in like, like the cheapest option is like two or 3% of the decisions we, purchasing decisions we make, buying decisions we make, two or 3%. So first of all, we got to get it out of our heads that money's the be all end all. It's only that way when there's when everything else is the same. So how do you make everything not, else not the same? It's the quality of your conversation. It's the understanding. Don't sell short understanding someone's situation, bringing the motivation to the surface. You know, um, I'll, I'll give you another example. If you went to, uh, if you put a, a bunch of married couples uh, who are happily married into a room. And you asked them the question of, how did you know this was the one, this was the person? When was it that you that you thought to yourself, this, this is the person for me? And half the time, the answer you're going to get is they understand me. They know the real me. They understand better than anyone else. They know what makes me tick. Now, if that motivation, just understanding a situation is enough to get someone to marry you, it's often enough to get somebody to take less for yours, uh, your offer. I'll give you another example, exact same thing. Um, lots of doctors out there, lots of very expensive specialists. When we have a serious medical issue, who do we go to? We go to the specialist. How much more do we pay? A lot more. Why do we pay specialists so much money? Well, because they're a specialist. That means that they understand our problems better than anyone else, so they are better equipped to fix them. So how do investors stand out? You understand the problem better than anyone else. So your prospect feels like you are the best equipped to fix them. Um, again, I get excited about this stuff. I know I'm talking a lot. I'm sorry for like dominating this conversation. Yeah, this is good. This is good. Uh, Alex R is asking, can you give an example of, of how you pursue understanding their motivation? Yeah, so motivation comes from two, two things really. Uh, often it's either getting away from something painful, something we don't like feeling. Uh, in this industry, it's, it's often that. But the other form of motivation is going towards something we want to feel. So first understand motivation is, is I no longer want to feel something I don't want to feel, or I'm scared I'm going to feel something I don't want to feel, or I want to feel this. All motivation can be lumped in those two categories. So to understand motivation, you're just going to ask a variation of one of those questions, right? So um, it's, we call, we call the, what you want to feel, we call that picture perfect question. So we ask that question just like that. Hey, let me ask you a question. If you do decide to sell, where are you going to go? Why there? How long have you been thinking about it? And I'm seeking to understand, are they trying to go somewhere? Um, if I'm not getting anywhere there, then I might flip-flop to what we call a problem question. Is there a pain they're trying to get away from? 
that might sound like uh, something like, hey, let me ask you a question. Um, what made you decide to even pick up the phone and call it? What I like to do is I, I like to use that going negative a little bit uh, that we talked about, that psychological reactance and sandwich it and then say, say something positive and then ask like, listen, I know the house needs some work. You, you've told me that. And I know it, it's been a pain for you, but you're in one of the best neighborhoods in the city. This is beautiful. Why in the world would you even consider selling at this point? And, and that's, a, a you know, well, I blah, blah, blah. So those are the two questions to find out what is their motivation? Are they, are they escaping the pain, going towards pleasure or a little bit of both? Once I get there, I'm going to ask, I'm going to go deeper. And going deeper is just getting people to talk more and more about it. We call them impact questions. It's just something you just keep the conversation going. What's that like? How long you've been thinking about that? When you say you're, you're tired of dealing with it, what do you mean? When you say that, you know, it, 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 it's been painful emotionally, what's that mean? What, what have you been dealing with? How long has that been going on? It, really? Tell me more, you know, just getting deeper and deeper into it. So those are just, there's three types of questions for motivation, problem, picture, perfect. And then you go, you go deeper with impact questions. And those are examples of each. Wow. Awesome. That's, uh, that's amazing. John, can you talk a little bit about uh, maybe some of the programs that you may have for the people that might be interested in maybe doing some sort of training or some sort of course with you? Yeah, so our core program is the REI Sales Academy. You can you can find we've got like uh, on our website MidwestRev.com. Um, it's mid, short for Rev Midwest Rev.com. On there you can find out about our programs. But even more than that, um, I think we've got like a hundred or hundred and fifty free training videos. We've got scripts. We've got all that kind of stuff. So if you go there, feel free to check out the program. But if you just want a bunch of free stuff too, we've got tons of tons of resources just just like today. Um, I, I try to share about everything I can. All the all the, the the program is, is it's just a very structured way for me to get all this information out so people have an easier time to adopt it and help with implementation and things like that. Um, so some people can take all the free stuff and go like, hey, this 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 is all I need. I'm running with it. And then some people say, hey, love it, but will you hold my hand through it and kind of walk me through it step by step? And that's what the program's for. Yeah, that's amazing. I, um, you know, we mentioned earlier that uh, I actually bought the program a couple of years ago, REI Sales Academy, and uh, yeah. I can tell you it's it's very much structured, right? Uh, you know, I bought a bunch of different digital products out there, learning to wholesale, you know, different types of sales training, stuff like that. And the interesting thing is, you know, it always looks great before you buy it. Uh, but when you actually buy it, it's like, oh, wow, it's only half an hour's worth of videos. It's always a little bit of disappointment when you buy a lot of these programs. But the one I got from John Martinez from a couple of years ago, and I'm sure, I don't know if it's you guys made improvements or if you tacked on more content, but a couple of years ago, I mean, that was packed full of content. I mean, I couldn't tell you how many hours of content there was, and it was very much structured like as a real course. So yeah, we, we have actually changed a little bit. We do it live now every single week. So you have access to all that stuff we've done in the past, but uh, every, that's where, I, what was it? Yesterday morning, every morning, 10 o'clock AM central where I am, I hop on and we go through, we have 12 modules. We just do once a week. And then when we're done, we just start over and we just do it over and over again for you know, people jump into as many as they want to. It's amazing. What's cool about it is, uh, whether you're just kind of a whole a solo wholesaler just trying to get started or whether you have say a small team it's it's applicable to both i think kind of the context behind the class is you're, you're trying to train a team you're trying to train your acquisitions manager up to speed but i mean if you're a solo guy i mean you are the acquisitions manager so you yeah. have to go through that program yourself yeah absolutely so, yeah right um Robert. Guys, we're live right now with the one and only John Martinez, one of the top sales trainers, I think, in the world, definitely the top in our industry. So if you're watching this live, you see we've got quite a few people watching live. Make sure to get your comments in below. We're going to be wrapping up in a couple of minutes. John, before we wrap up the show, I got to ask you for your advice on a real live deal killer. Okay. This one, I haven't actually seen this one for quite a while. Uh, it's a little bit unique. So Tarek Al Musa's team, they got this awesome deal. Got it signed up. Uh, you know, should be like I don't know, fifty to hundred thousand dollar assignment fee. And the only issue with the deal is there's a tenant in the property. Okay, now wasn't an issue though because we talked to the tenant. The tenant said, "Yeah, I'll, I'll move out. That's fine." Signed the paperwork, got the property under contract, got a buyer lined up and everything. But then the tenant comes back and says, "I'm not leaving. 
if you want me out, you're going to have to evict me. But guess what? You can't because of COVID. So suck on it. Yeah. How, how do you deal with a situation like that? What's your advice? Is there any way to save this deal? Yeah. So the advice is this, right? That, that, that individual needs to be sold just like the original sale, right? There are motivations. There's reasons why he would voluntarily, and there's reasons why he wouldn't. So we have to seek to understand those. So it's not just something you hop over. It's, it's, and this is what happens, you know, I, I've trained teams in, in dozens of industries, and this is what we consider a complex sale, right? There's multiple decision makers. Whether you like it or not, this person is now a decision maker, right? Because he's, he's influencing the decision. So with, mul with multiple decision makers, you take them each through the sales process, some more than others, but I would, I would go right in there. I understand, right? You know, if you did, if you did, you know, you, you obviously are holding the ball here. I understand that. And I, I think you need to do what's best for you. Um, let me ask you this question. If you did decide to move for whatever reason, pick up and, and go, even during COVID, why would you? Why am I asking that question? I'm trying to get a sneak peek into what is his motivation. I'm looking for something like, well, if I knew I could get into a place and it was more comfy than this and I had a little bit of assistance, then I, I would move. Then I'm digging in. Well, you, you said a couple of things there. If you had some assistance and in a more comfy place, when you say more comfy, what do you mean? Now that's an impact question. Well, I, I've never really been happy with this place. You know, it, it's kind of small and cramped, but it, it is what it is. Small and cramped. Is that a big deal or is that a little deal? Now I'm bringing all that motivation to the surface because when I get to my presentation, I'm going to hit that, right? So I'm going to do the same thing. I'm going to set the stage, relieve uh, tensions, fears, anxieties. I'm going to go through my motivation. I'm going to bring it to the surface. Once I know he's motivated to take action, I'm then going to address the deal killers, what's going to get in the way. And then I'm going to show him how I, how I can help him by connecting all the dots of those things. So the answer is he, he needs to be sold. He needs to be taken through that same because all selling is, is assisting someone through the decision making process. So that's what I'm going to do is sell them exact same process. Now, there's an additional layer of complexity on this, though. The guy is ghosting. How yeah. do you deal with that? Yeah. So, you know, you've got to use a tremendous amount of that tactical empathy we talked about. And we got to pull all the way back going for the no. So a text might sound something like this. First, I'm going to assume it's a hard, hard no. Hey, listen, number one, I, I'm embarrassed. Um, I feel terrible. I feel like I, I pushed way too hard on this and I misread the entire situation and that's my fault. I apologize. My guess is even if we were able to talk, no matter what we were able to, to offer or do for you or how we structured uh, what we could do for you, there's no way you're going to consider moving out of that house at any time unless you were evicted months down the road. That's the only way you would ever, ever leave. And if, if that's the case, that's perfectly fine. I want you to know I understand. You need to do whatever's best for you. I apologize that I goofed this one up. You see, with, with empathy, in order to get people back, you got to take you got to take responsibility for their feelings. You're feeling pressured. That's my fault. You're feeling like you're getting the short end of the stick. That's my fault. And I feel bad. I shouldn't have done that to you. It wasn't my intention, but I've put you into a situation where you feel like this is the only answer and that's that's 100% my fault, I'm sorry. Gut says this thing's going nowhere, no matter what that's we can do with this, right? So that's, that's that, that, that's kind of the talk track I would go into. That's that's the only, the best way you got to re-engage in that conversation. I love it, thanks for the feedback. We're gonna try that and then I'm gonna let you know when we Perfect. meet next week for your mastermind, uh, exactly how that goes. Awesome, awesome. Brittany, I know yeah. you have questions. Yeah, no. Always, but um, I really want to hear more about how the smaller wholesalers can best compete. Um, I think having that one-on-one -on -one conversation, that in-person conversation in a market so full of virtual wholesaling can be a really great competitive advantage, but how can people use that? Yeah, I mean, it, it is the competitive advantage. Whenever you talk about the small guy versus the big guy, it, it the, the sales process, that conversation is the competitive advantage. It's not who can offer more. It's not who has the most bells and whistles or the best, better business bureau rating. We do business with people we trust and who can connect those dots and, and we feel are, are best equipped to serve us. So 
whether it's, and I'll tell you, I train, um, I, one of the teams I train is a hedge fund with I think 2000 agents spread across the US who are buying houses for cash. And then a lot of my teams are, you know, on the other side are those solopreneurs. They're doing everything themselves and they need to make sure that when they do go on a sales call, they close every closable deal. The way both of those teams are winning when they win is the quality of that sales conversation. That's it. The reason the, the, the hedge fund is winning deals versus the other people in the market is that conversation. The reason when the little guy wins against the hedge fund or the bigger players or the, uh, it's the quality of that conversation. So that, that is the answer. The competitive advantage, uh, advantage is the sales process. It, it's not the. Sorry. Are there, are there things that you see smaller companies that do better than larger companies or what are the, um, what are the real sticking points that you see most often for smaller companies? Like what are they not doing well? What are they not doing well? Um, I think that can fall into a couple of categories. Um, uh, small companies usually means uh, we we're trying to stretch the least amount of resources the most. I mean, my, my whole business is myself, my wife and assistant. So I know that well, right? You only have so many resources and you're trying to compete with, they've got these automated systems, they've got all this. and they, So how do we compete with, with that? So um, as people try to figure that out, a lot of the times what they do is they try to short circuit that conversation. The biggest problem I see is they, the, smaller companies that start to fail is they feel like their answer is cherry picking. They say, for example, here's something I hear often. Listen, I'm running this thing by myself. I can only go see five, six people a week. I'm getting leads now. I can't talk to them and have this conversation with everybody, right? So what I'm doing is I'm looking at this lead sheet. I'm looking for a sign of motivation. I'm looking, maybe I'm tossing out a super low ball offer to see if they bite. And based on that little bit of information up front, I'm cherry picking who I spend my time with. And because of that, they're often wrong. We've every investor out there has done deals where it started out where you threw them, maybe maybe you try to feel out an offer and it was a no way, Jose, and there was no motivation. I was just you send me stuff all the time. I was just, but once the conversation happens, yeah, they're tremendously distressed and motivated, right? There's all kinds of reasons. So people who try to skip skip actually having a conversation and just try to cherry pick based on these these very small upfront data points that are oftentimes not accurate that's where they fail and i see big companies fail that same way they start to get big revenues increasing they increase uh lead generation now we're flooded with leads we went from 100 a month to 300 a month what do the acquisition agents do shoot i used to have 10 weeds a, a leads a week to work so I, I really took my time with them now i've got 30 leads a, a week to work so now i'm looking at those leads trying to read the future, guess which ones are, are the ones that are going to sell and only spending my time with those. So I would say the biggest danger for big and small is the same uh, that I see. Once you start trying to cherry pick and read the future before actually having the conversation, conversion rates just absolutely die. Wow, awesome feedback. Guys, we're wrapping up here. Uh, John, any final thoughts? <laughs> uh, I, you know, I, if I just final thoughts for this conversation, I guess if I was sum it up, it's uh, you got to have the conversation. We're all looking for shortcuts. Everyone wants shortcuts, but the bottom line is the people out there in this industry that are crushing it. They're, they're, they're this is a cliche, right? No shortcuts. They're sticking to the fundamentals. They're running the plays. They're putting in the work. There, there, there's no shortcuts. So uh, just like professional athletes do. They stick to the fundamentals. They get really good at them. They don't ever skimp, right? Once a professional athlete gets gets good, they don't stop practicing. They don't they don't only play a quarter of the game, right? You go all out every time. So um, have the conversation. That's that's the best advice I could give. Stop trying to take shortcuts and work yeah. every lead uh, like it needs to be. Amazing. Brittany, any any final questions or thoughts? No, I think you guys have really been thorough and I really appreciate the differentiation points between smaller wholesalers or smaller companies and larger companies. I think that's really important. Absolutely. John Mark, you, any, any final questions or thoughts for John Martinez while we have him on here? 
Oh man, I think um, I think it's about it. But uh, it's been a phenomenal hour. You know, I'm sure all the viewers have got a ton of value out of it. So you know, if they're looking for additional training, definitely check out John Martinez's website and see what they can offer. Absolutely, I'm going to throw it up here on the screen. Uh, it is midwestrev.com, guys. Definitely, definitely check it out. I can't tell you how much your business can transform. Uh, by just using the sales tactics and techniques that John teaches uh, in his courses and in his trainings. Every one of us is spending money on marketing, right? We're spending $200, $300 a lead and only converting one in 50, you're throwing a lot of money out the window, right? So definitely, definitely, definitely uh, spend some time, invest some money and check out John's courses uh, because I think that that's one of the best ways that you can really transform your business and increase your return on investment. Uh, John, if people are watching this right now and they want to reach out and contact you, what's the best way for them to do that? Yeah, there's a thousand different ways. Uh, just our website, you can contact us through there. Um, I recommend people get into our, our email drip. We don't sell stuff through it. It's just, uh, it, it's all content. And uh, that email drip actually comes from my my personal email. So people, when people reply to it, it comes straight to me, awesome. and I, I reply back. So that's probably the easiest way awesome. is through there. Awesome, awesome. Well, John, thanks so much for jumping on. We got to have you on here again. I, I'm gonna try out your tips that you gave, and okay. we're definitely gonna have to do a follow up segment on, on, on how things what things went with that. So thanks so much, John. Brittany, thanks for jumping on, guys. Brittany, if you're if you guys are in Baltimore, definitely check out Baltimore Deal Makers. Uh, Brittany is going to be the new host of Baltimore Deal Makers. Brittany, anything you want to say to the audience about Baltimore Deal Makers? Super excited! You guys have created an awesome jumping off point, and there's just so much content. And there's so much movement, especially in Baltimore. So I can't wait to connect with everyone and connect people to each other and do more deals. Awesome! We're excited for it. Once again, guys, thanks for everyone joining in on, and we'll talk to you next time. Make some money. Guys, thanks for joining us on the live show tonight. If you're on Facebook, make sure to join our Facebook group. Uh, it's facebook.com slash dealmakernation. Uh, tons of great content in that group. Tons of great people. Make sure you're joining the community, join the network, and learning from other like-minded entrepreneurs. Also, on YouTube, make sure to subscribe to our channel. Uh, you can find it at youtube.com slash dealmakernation. Uh, thanks for joining us.